there was a problem, yo, I'll solve it. Word to your mother. <sighs> oh, God. Hey, everybody. It's <laughs> Imagine that's the way the enthusiasm I came to this show with. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> hey, everybody. It is Two Cool Moms. I'm Joe Gatto. I'm Steve Byrne. And we are here momming it up. Momming it up. Mm -mm. You know what song Just has been in my head? Momming it up. That's <laughs> our new theme song. Momming it momming up. up. <laughs> um, uh, it can be heard in a CVS, a Rite Aid, or Walgreens mm -hmm. at least once every six hours. Gregory Abbott. Greggy Abs? Greggy Abs. Do you remember the song? To Touch It But Don't. You just <laughs> made that up, correct? <laughs> Greg to, Abbott's it's his biggest hit. To touch it. To touch it, but don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, the things you come up with. Uh, uh, I'll give you a hint. Ready? Heeny, meeny, miny, mo. Come on, ah, girl, let's start the show. You got it. One touched it, but you did. <laughs> you don't remember this song? No, what is it? it Roses are red and, and violets are blue. blue. I'm going to rock this town with you. Oh, that's great. Away, away. I don't know that song. You read my mind. I de Jiggy saying I definitely know it. Break you down. Oh wait, oh wait. Oh, that's oh okay. I, I just don't. I just don't know an need. Asian American singing it. I know Greg Abbott singing. It. Yeah, I, I need to be black with a perm, <laughs> and have my collar you open. Said, you and, know, uh, in another life, yeah, you would have been an amazing talent in a, some sort <laughs> another, of another, another life. Talent. Yes, yeah. an amazing talent as an entertainer. You're. Yeah. you're you're on, in another life. You, you're you pretty untouchable. Right. You're pretty untouchable in this life as an mm -hmm. entertainer. You've, you're definitely, you know, high bees. But if you were like a, <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> yeah, yeah, good, <laughs> good. No, like, no, you're great. You know, I yeah. love you. Well, I'm, I'm joshing you. But what, I, what you, uh, if you had musical talent, the show you'd put on. Oh my God! Yeah. I imagine if you'd I be could like, sing, I can't. You'd be like Bruno Mars level. You, you're a sh because you're a showman. You're a showman, and that's what's missing out of a lot I'm of the business. Hugh Jackman in. The greatest. Yeah. You're the greatest showman. Yeah. No, I, I would, honestly, I would think you'd be a hell of a, like, you'd put on a great performance. Yeah. I've seen you do karaoke, which is comedian's version of <laughs> being a, 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 a singer. I'm the greatest. Yes. Yeah. But don't you think you would do uh, an amazing job as a- I, I'd love it. If you had it, musical talent. Doing, doing those shows with you guys when we, when oh, you yeah. guys took me in Europe, those were the funnest shows I've been a part of because you're, you're not only, you know, watch your friends do- incredible work and sitting there watching every single show and seeing how how arenas react as right. opposed to you know just your standard cut and paste kind of comedy clubs but then to like live out the fantasy of being a rock star of jumping off stage Amazing. going to the back of the room letting people pick out a song which was already picked because right. of the way it was structured <laughs> and then walking through the crowd to the stage and then when the song culminates and builds to a crescendo to yes. see you guys jump out, that was like- It was, it was one of the greatest things. So oh cool. my God, that was the funnest. And I'm like, I get it now. I totally understand why bands do this. It's I the greatest feeling. I find that intimidating in a different way. So like when we did the Imagine Dragons punishment, we did a punishment on the show where Sal and I had to open for the Imagine Dragons, which we called the Imagination Dragons <laughs> on, and we were, uh, Senor Alonza was the name of our band. Yeah. It was a shout out to our high school, um, Spanish teacher, mm -hmm. she what what happened was when that when you we walked out there, mm -hmm. that was a totally different feeling when you had to entertain people with music. Yeah, and also on top of not being a musician, but it's just a different vibe in a music venue. Like people want to dance and say like the energy is right. way. You sit there, and the crowds in comedy are great. I love them, but they're sitting there and they're waiting to laugh. Right, right? you can shift and pivot but, within jokes. Right, but when there's song, the trains left the station. You're now committed 100%. for forty five minutes. The audience to that is song. way more uh, a part of the show than in a comedy show. They're a part of the show in a different way than a music show. Yeah, I think it was they're comedy, singing along, they're, they're reactive, exactly. as opposed to being just, just it's pressed in stone. You know yep. what you're doing. You know what you're, you're there to see Paul McCartney sing Let It Be. Right, and you're singing along with him. You're not yelling out punchlines to ruin jokes. Right, or so, so sometimes different. there are some do. people, and they that. make up their own punchlines, <laughs> and, they're not, and sometimes they're better than ours, and that really stinks. <laughs> that <is true. laughs> Every now and then that's you get it. that, but like, then you just steal and take it to the next city. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Yeah. and that show killed in Cincinnati. <laughs> uh, it's true. I mean, I... have you thought? Because look, there's nobody that enjoys a dance floor more than you. Nobody. nobody. You'd be hard oh, pressed. All my friends. Hard pressed to find anybody that enjoys this being on a dance floor. I'm in my natural state on a dance floor. I love it. Well, I'm a blooming onion. I think one of my favorite <laughs> scenarios of seeing you, and it's not just 
it's not just you're enjoying the dance floor. You are the Pied Piper on the dance floor. I make it an event. I get, I bring people in. Oh, I'm like, let's do all it. All you need is that marching step <laughs> stick that they twirl around and drum line and, yeah, yeah. you know, whatever. But but when we did the uh, the Nashville Comedy Festival, I think it was the second year, and everybody heard about the Bud Light Lounge, which became infamous because you came and, you know, got the party started. <laughs> not drinking, um, by the way. <laughs> not drinking. That's when I found out you at were the, sober. I was like, what at the? the Bud Light Lounge, <laughs> just dead sober, oh tearing up the God. dance floor. Yeah. But what happened was... There was bench seating along the wall on one side, bench seating along the wall on the other side. And so we were all sitting on one side, and then you had some people sitting on the other side. And you got us to stand up on each on opposing sides, sing Piano Man to each other. Mm -hmm. And then you got in the middle, and you were entertaining while we're all like on stage singing. It, I've never seen anything like it I in my life. That. It was like... Yeah. I heard like at bar mitzvahs they have like party starters, that's like me. hype people, yeah, that's and that's that was you at the I, I Nashville just, Festival. I just love giving people permission to have fun. Yeah. Because I feel like so much of it is people just in their own head. And if you are, could look less awkward than the most awkward guy, you'll do it. You're now in it. Uh, yeah. You'll you, find, you. I've seen you. Yeah. You pull out the, the wallflower. 100%. You're like, no, 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 no. You didn't no, come no. out to sit there and sip Not your on my club soda. Let's <laughs> get out of here. That's right, yeah. Let's get out of here. Let's get Put them down legs Shirley pumping. Temple. Yeah. Yeah, I my I growing up my kitchen was a dance floor. My mother um, she used to love. I remember to this day we had my father uh, for my mom's birthday. She got a uh, audio entertainment center for the kitchen. So it had oh for the kitchen like the fold out speakers. Right, it was a right. little piece of furniture. It was probably about as high as this table, about up to mm -hmm. here, right from the ground. Uh, it had fold out speakers, mm -hmm. and then inside of it, it had a, a double cassette deck. It had a turntable on the top and a radio. Wow. And, uh, and a CD player. It was like the whole shebang. Everything. Right, so it had everything right here, and it was right in my kitchen. And my yeah. mom used to, we used to turn that kitchen into, when my mom was cooking, she'd throw in her favorite CD. We'd be, you know, it'd be raining uh, men all over my kitchen. Are, right? Is my, there a song that comes to mind when you have a dish, like you're at a restaurant, you spaghetti meatballs, or is there something she cooked all the time that instantly you think of a song associated with? No, but whenever I hear the song, It's Raining Men, I think of my mother. It's raining men, well, hallelujah. You know? <laughs> thank God, thank God, that's not your dad's favorite song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, she she would like she, she you know, you know temperatures rising, <laughs> and she would do the whole thing. You know, <laughs> barometer's getting low. Like she would do, low, low, low. like she would do that. You in your element, dude. That's it. And we would, me and my sisters would do a choreographed dance as my mom yeah. was like stirring the sauce, and I still remember she would take out sauce and all. She'd take it out for the first time. It should be making a mess singing. And I'm we so glad I know fun. this because imagine if we're taking a road trip like a year from now, <laughs> that song comes on, everything gets quiet. I look over and you're just like this. I'm like, Joe, is there something you want to tell me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you sing songs to your children when they go to sleep? I or when don't they're younger, sing songs, they're older. but when we drive. When you drive. When we drive, we sing songs. Yeah, we, I like And my daughter can actually sing. My son is, you know, he's a kid. He sounds, I can't sing. I, I, I'm like, yeah. I, I have one level. This is it. So yeah. we're staying right in this zone, but my daughter can actually hit different pitches and stuff. And yeah. so when we're when we're driving, yeah, everybody sings. I crank it up, and yeah. I have music on all, all the, time the time in the house. All, it, my yeah. wife would the, the home would be as quiet as a tomb. Yeah, she does. She she's fine with her own thoughts. You like you need a distraction so you don't just continually hate yourself. Yeah, or her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop it! Just the best. I think the uh, I, I when I was growing up, like my. My mom and my dad. My dad had this song. Do you know the song "Bye Bye Blackbird"? Of course. Yeah. So that yeah. was my dad's favorite song, and he used wow. to he used to sing that to us. Like at it was the only song I remember hearing my father sing. My father wasn't the singer at all. He was, he was more of a quiet guy. Um, deadpan comedy. That was his thing. You never apologize, but you wake up with a toy at your at your doorstep. You know? <laughs> no, just, no. Yeah. no, he was just he was just wasn't like an out there. He was like more of a little bit, you know. Yeah, in, in than my introvert than my mother, who was a flip of that, of course. And so you get it from your mom, then. I get from my mom and my to be dad. Very affectionate. I, but I get from my mom. My dad. My, yeah. my my dad was super affectionate. Yeah. He was just not a, like he was not like the center of attention kind of guy. But he was funnier than my mother. Like oh, really? He, oh my god, he was a, he was a killer. He was hysterical. He was, was so it dry, funny. dry, yeah, dry. My favorite story. I ever tell a story about when he was playing craps in Atlantic City. He's playing craps in Atlantic City, and these two half a gangsters at the end. And there was I didn't this, hear this one. So there's I, two. There's. I heard the one about the guy falling down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's in Atlantic City. He's playing craps. Yeah. And I, actually, you know what? It was no. I'm sorry. It was on their honeymoon. Mm -hmm. It's Caesar's Palace in, oh, in Vegas. Vegas. Okay. So my father is playing craps, and there's these two, you know, half a gangsters, mm -hmm. cigars, whole nine, you know, shirts undone. It's been late night. You know, sure. My, my father, uh, you know, he's, he's there and he's playing craps. My mom is at the slot machine. 
and the guys, there's a woman rolling the dice, yeah. and she's doing, she, you know, she's crushing. By the way, you got to be funny. Yeah, oh yeah, for this story. Uh, to yeah, work. yeah, yeah, that's very good. Because yeah, you're setting the table, right? So she's crushing. She's mm -hmm. crushing. She's like, you know, and every time she rolled, they would all clap. But crap tables are long, you know, 14 yeah. feet away from each other, so you could talk under your breath, and the other people can't hear you. Mm -hmm. So the two guys were like, yeah, very go, I'll go get it, honey. And they'd be like, come on, you fat bitch, you got it. They were like doing all this stuff, like, and then what you got? Yeah, yeah. So they need yeah. like a hard. They're like roll the hard six, you fat son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah, you know, like being that. And my father, like, yeah. he got, he just like it got quiet. She rolled her six, whatever. They're waiting. They're resetting the dice. And my father just looks over them and he goes, "Guys, I'd appreciate it if you stop talking about my wife that way." <laughs> and the two gangsters turned completely white and started apologize. Oh. And he goes, "Now nah, I'm just fucking with you. Let's get that hot six. And that was so good. Like that's my favorite. That's my dad. Like he just oh knew. He made it awkward for everybody. Like that's a perfect. That's story. hilarious. Yeah. 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 And then your then your drinks are calm yeah. the rest of the night. Yeah. And he said wow. he just hung out with those guys and and you that know they had a great so night cool. playing craps together. That's but. the greatest icebreaker in the world for sure. It's just a great joke. Yeah. And he just like the, the, just to put the embarrassment on them so far. Yeah. And that's I believe like I get. I get a bunch for both of them, but yeah. But he was used to saying "Bye Bye Blackbird," and my mother used to sing uh, "I Love You a Bushel and a Peck." I, don't I know. love you a bushel and a peck. It was uh, who sang it? Donna Summers. No, Dora Neitenberg. <laughs> don't quote me on this, but it was Deborah Gargenberg. And uh, g look it up for me. It's, it's it's also the D. You you know her. She's an old school song yeah. song songstress. And she, my my, I try to sing to my kids like at night when they were younger. <laughs> What's her name? What's the name? Doris Day. Doris Day. Doris Day. I didn't know Doris Day. Way off. Yeah. <laughs> Dasha Doris. Goldberg? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I would start singing that to my yeah. to my daughter, and she loved when I sang. And then my son started going. He started just wanting <laughs> it perfectly. I'm trying to sing to him to sleep. He's yeah. like three years old. And I'm just like looking at him. He's so cute. And I'm like, I love you, a bushel and a peck. And he literally just with his little hand just goes up and goes. <laughs> That'll do, about. pig. And that was it. And then he rolled yeah. over and fell asleep. I'm like, no, well, like, that's the really? thing. It was amazing. Oh my yeah. god, that that's pretty much what my, my wife does every two weeks <laughs> when I'm from back from the road. I go, honey, that's it. Rolls over. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Uh, so yeah, well, I love music in a house. I love music. I love always. There was always such a big part of our cruises too. Like you know, you were there, but for me, it was way. It was as fun to be on there karaokeing with everybody and singing. You had, did, did I show you the? Remember, I sent you the picture. I, Joe DeRosa is singing a song. Mm -hmm. We're doing karaoke on the cruise outside. Yes. And it was so fun. That that whole, the cruise was like, I did it the first year, and the second year I, I told my wife, Jess, I'm like, you got to come. Mm -hmm. You're, you're going to have an absolute blast. Because yeah. it's, normally it's, you know, things are centered around the shows, but it's like, this is great. So we come, we're, we're at the karaoke, we're catching up with DeRosa. DeRosa's about to sing a Weezer song or something. And I want to get pictures of him. Great pictures. And every time I raised my camera, you saw me pull my camera up and you would obstruct my view. And it wasn't until like the fourth or fifth time I realized you were doing it because I was going to take a picture of Joe and I just kept like, I, I'd move and then you'd move. And then I was just like, what the? And the last picture is you, the whole crowd's out there. The song's out there. And you stand in front of me, like you're me. You stand in front of me and you go like this. <laughs> and you're looking like at a steam pipe, and I'm like, "What, you mother? You have yeah, those pictures. We got to put them up in the pod. I pond. have the picture. Yeah, yeah. I sent uh, it to you because I told you that story, like, yep, like I right now. after the cruise, and I was dying yeah. laughing afterwards, looking through, because I saw like me taking it, and your it was back's like a, it was there. like a flip book. And then you're kind of like this. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it was so funny. I didn't realize it until I saw the photographic evidence, yeah. and then it was like I put it together. I'm like, that mother. <laughs> yeah, I love sharing the stage with you in comedy, but I also love sharing sharing the stage with you as as karaoke partners. Oh, karaoke is the best. Yeah, I love like singing and 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 entertain. I'm I'm not a good singer, but I'm a hell of a hype man. Yeah, like I'll do that. I mean, I on the cruises, Sal. You know, he's he's actually got a pretty. Uh, uh, probably the best voice out of all of us, um, which isn't really a, or which really isn't a thing, but he's, he could he could sing. If he knows a song, he sings with passion. He, he brings he's thunder. He's passionate. He's passionate. That's how we describe it. Although Q singing an Elvis song, Q singing pretty an Elvis on. song is pretty spot on too. Yeah. And then Murray with any 80s ballad, but he kind of feels like you should put him to sleep because <laughs> he's like, he seems like it's his last thing getting out. But I, I will say that... Uh, Sal, when he gets into like a sing thing, I love being his hype man, jumping up behind him. Yeah. I love being a hype man on... On a on a stage for yeah. sure, that, I I I think it's it's one of the funnest ways to kind of I think if you have something interactive like that that closes a show that's mm -hmm. why the comedy jam is the greatest show, show ever great. I think show I, I really love do it. think yeah, it's those guys the funnest. Yeah. Um,
But I, only one time I did it was uh, New Year's Eve in Irvine. Uh, for some reason, I was I was a little was a little shangots, uh-huh. <laughs> and I said, uh, "Hey, mi- play Mr. Brightside." And I said, "Everybody want to sing this together?" And it was one of those things where spontaneously it just happened, and the whole crowd sang it, and that's how we ended the show. And I was like, "Wow, I should do that again." I never did it again because I'm, yeah, I'm obviously self conscious about my singing, but Aww. but uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Y- you know, but you are a terrible singer. Can. It's good to be self aware. Shall we get into this? Let's do it. Let's help. Thank you, everybody, for writing in. Please follow at Two Cool Moms. Watch us on YouTube, and you know, just send Steve love letters to his home. <laughs> now we're going to start off with uh, with a question from Brian. Oh, okay. Oh, th- it looks loaded the way you looked at me. You ready? Ready. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we go. On question one. This is why I love what you guys do. So please keep these coming, <laughs> and know they could be anything. And this is an example. Okay. Okay. Hey, Two Cool Moms. I have a bit of an issue. (laughs) I pooped on the floor of my grandmother's basement and never picked it up. I was 11 at the time, and the bathroom had a line. I couldn't wait. Do I tell her now? (laughs) (laughs) That's been years. He pooped on the floor of his uh, grandma's basement. Well, he's still carrying this around with him. This guilt is still... Brewing, if it's a real story, I'm kind. It's kind of suspect to me. It's quite suspect. Quite suspect. But, but I do appreciate the originality in not just pooping on the floor, but now there's a time lapse, mm-hmm. and it's been there and it's dried up, or the grandma cleaned it up. <laughs> Probably the grandma cleaned it up, but, but imagine uh, she discovered the poop at this point. I always think honesty is the best policy. I would follow through and let her know. Hey, now you know what though? I will, I will flip Keep it for the a second. Going? I know it's not because here's what you're gonna do. You're yeah. gonna ruin. You're going to ruin a joke that's been playing out only for him with a grandmother that's like, I have a ghost in my house, and it's been shitting. <laughs> <laughs> it took a poop. I, she has no, that's a ghost poop. She has no idea where that poop came from. That's what we should do. We should find. We should ask Brian, where's your grandma's house? Right. We'll come in. We'll keep the joke going. Yes, for yeah. sure. Break in an anus, <laughs> rock a deuce in the basement, and Peace dipski. Out. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, is it, were there any signs of fourth century uh, officer? <laughs> no, there was, there was none. Okay. There's a Korean water ghost. Just, uh, <laughs> All over the place. Left a batch of yes. dried ramen noodles. And he clearly, loves pe- clearly loves peanuts. In a log. <laughs> <laughs> peanuts and corn, yeah. All right. Good luck to you, Brian. Uh, we say keep it going. Keep it going. Yeah, don't tell Grams. All right. We, we normally uh, try not to go into this territory, but this is from Ellen, and I thought this might be fun for you. Ellen, got it. Okay. This isn't a Two Cool Moms question. Oh, if it uh, starts like that, of course, of course, it's not something we go into. But okay, go ahead. But I thought this 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 might be worth answering. Okay, yeah. I was hoping because I've tried and tried with no luck to find out where some key Joker points are. We're driving uh, seventeen hundred plus hours from Central Texas to New York to do an impractical Joker's vacation. The first week of June, for the first time, we're doing Staten Island, riding the ferry, okay. seeing where R and H is and was brewed. Visiting Ambrose, Ambrosinos, Ambrosinos for yep. a slice of hot pepper pie. Of course, yeah. And who's, who knows what else? I know the amazing building you hadukened, hadukened. Hadukened in is in Snug Harbor, so we would like to see that. We want to visit the Boom, I Got Your Nose Bitch statue, Yes, but not sure where it is. Can you please tell me where to go for all the great places, uh, all where I know, you guys have been in New York. It's a full two days drive each way, so we want to see as much as possible. Um, oh. Sal's haunted house punishment is that a public building? No, it intrigues me. Um, thanks, Joe. Uh, appreciate all the laughs. Oh, that's sweet. That was very sweet. Well, I will say, if you're going to go around New York City, you're just going to go. You're going to hit the main parks that we did. You're going to hit Washington Square Park. You're going to notice a bunch of stuff that we've done there. That's where. A lot of bits of were done, and you, you'll recognize a lot of them. The three main parks we worked out of were that one, uh, Union Square Park, uh, where we played Strip High Five, me and Murray, and uh, a bunch of other things, Sal's Torture Punishment, so many things were done there. Um, and then the other one where you're talking about the Boom, I Got Your Nose Bitch statue is, uh, is adjacent to a park, which is in downtown Manhattan, on the other side of the ferry, actually. It's, it's Battery Park. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Battery Park, which is right down... In front, of, if you get off the Staten Island Ferry, just walk straight and you walk right into it. Those are probably the three parks where you probably hit the you get the most bang for your buck because you could see all we would do is move the camera, right? right. So you'd have a different backdrop, it would look like a different park. Sure, so yeah. So it was a nice, it was a nice hack. Washington Square Park always had the craziest people, and then you could throw in the later seasons. We got kicked out of Washington Square Park; we weren't allowed to film there anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so we did you have to have a permit for it? Or you did, we, you did, because yeah. we were too big of a footprint. And then they revoked it. Yeah, they were like, no, nah, no, thanks. But they gave us a different park. They gave us Thompson Square Park, okay. and that you'll you'll recognize a lot of that's stuff. 34th? That's the one where I get the people to watch my dogs. No, that's downtown too. Any other spots that 
you would recommend? I mean, you got to go. You got to go to Dallas Barbecue and in, in you got to hit up Times Square, right? We, we're in Times Square a lot, but Dallas Barbecue is where we've done a bunch of of things. I, oh, is Dallas Barbecue still open? I no. I don't think it made it through. Jimmy's closed. Jimmy's is closed. Dallas Barbecue is still there. Okay, so if, if we did there, um, you got to go to uh, the, the my favorite, probably one of my favorite um, bakeries, dessert places, Ferrara's downtown uh, in Little Italy. That's where we worked. Um, you'll notice that place. And if you want to go for a deep cut, and it seems like she does know a lot yeah, of cool she knows things. A lot. If you want to go for a deep cut, and I don't know if this is still open either, Jiggy. Do you know if it's still open? It was uh, the Odd Lot down on Fulton Street. Yeah, the uh, the one that had the it was that store. We've done so many things in that store. It was like a, it was basically like a mini New York version of a department store. Sure, and it just let us run whatever the hell we wanted to do in there. <laughs> I, I tore that place up. Yeah, so those those be the places I say to go. All right, cool. Well, Ellen, I and hope- also you're in New York City, the greatest city in the world. So why don't you go like to the Empire State Building, like at the top of the Rock? Yeah, go I'd see a Broadway recommend. show. Oh, go to the top of Rock. That's New York Titty, greatest titty in the world. Top of the Rock. <laughs> That's right. That's, yeah, that's where that one happened. So yeah, Rock uh, Rockefeller Center's observatory. What is your go to in New York City? Like if when you have a day free, one of my favorite. Oh, things you mean if I'm if somebody's going to visit me and what I want to show them, or if I'm just going to kill some time? Yeah. And- what's your What's your go to in New York? In New York, I mean. Emilio's Bellato. Have I taken you there yet? It's an it's an Italian joint. No, you're it's taking right everybody the else there but me. Yeah, I all should, your good friends. I but should me. take. I should take I you never there. Been. I should never take even you. mention it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only time you do mention it is when you say, "Oh, I got I got a great friend in town. I got to go to." <laughs> I leave you. Yeah. I just, just leave like, you. Oh, okay. And you gave me a bus map last time, which I was like, oh, "Okay." No, I called an Uber <laughs> for you. Uh, I would say Emilio's Bellato is a good is a really good. It was introduced to me by actually our manager Jack Rovner is awesome and. Uh, such a great little spot. It doesn't take reservations. It's like you walk in. He knows everybody. He's As one of those is. guys that walks around, sits sits with you, but he's not like a maitre d'. He's like a guy, sure. you know, just, hey, he's been there forever. He's got pictures with everybody on the walls. Really great food. Food's unbelievable. Um, yeah, I would say that's a, that's a big one for me. But then also I love, my favorite observatory is actually the Top of the Rock. Really? Yeah, I like it better than any of them. But in fairness, I haven't been to the top of uh, the Freedom Tower. Um, but I would say I think that's... That's just such a good vibe there. It's also nostalgic for like the Christmas tree. Like when growing sure, up, I yeah. always went to the Christmas tree in Rock Center. So Rockefeller Center, nothing better than the holidays yeah, and visiting sure. that. Well, a hidden gem for me is actually Fulton Street Market. Downtown Manhattan, there's oh, yeah. a little the Cobblestone Street area. It's where I used to live off of Wall Street yeah. uh, downtown. And during Christmas, they do a great time too. During the holiday season, they put up like a tree. They have a little fake ice skating rink, the whole nines, yeah. which is really fun. But also down there, there's some of the best. There's one, the best movie theater in Manhattan is down there, the IPEC theater which oh, is one of those great. which i love then they have a row of beautiful uh so a little bit of shopping yeah but a lot of like great restaurants well ellen my suggestion to you is brooklyn diner on 57th it's my go-to it's like a classic chrome kind of kind of diner but the waiters all dress with bow ties mm. a little pricey but the chili's fantastic you'll get great kind of like jewish deli sandwiches great pastrami they have a foot long like hot dog that my daughter got last time and they deliver it, and she was just like, you know, seeing a little kid go, oh, my yeah, God. That's a lot. And yeah. it's just a great vibe, and it's one of those places, too. Again, if you come during the holidays, they got the train going around, uh, the rail car up top, cool. and it's all dressed in garland. It, it's just, it's such a, like, a almost like romantic. Yeah, it, it's that's really because I've never been there. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, okay, yeah, so... Now uh, uh, the boomerang gets thrown back oh, to your uh, face. I, uh, I don't. Aussie. Uh, good. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is a this is a quick quick and to the point from Kenny. Kenny, I'm sending you good mojo out of the gates here. Would love a tip on how not to be shy. It's tough. It's tough. Um, not to be shy. Now, this isn't something I specifically have battled with, but I have helped people come out of their shell. And we just actually spoke about this organically earlier. Yeah. Um, I will say, put yourself in situations where there's somebody else to look at and raise your, or something else, not even somebody to look at, and raise your level up a little bit and come mm-hmm. out of your shell a little bit. So, for instance, if you are at the Rockefeller Center tree, people are looking at the tree and whatnot. It's an easy play if you want to talk to a stranger to be like, wow, the tree is really pretty. Yeah. Right. You have something you have a common ground to talk to people with. A lot of shyness for me is people just don't know what to say. Sure. They put so much pressure on the first thing to say. You could say anything. Yeah. You could say, well, almost anything, but you know what I mean? You could say anything at the beginning just to start a conversation. It doesn't have to be what's a great conversation starter. Whatever someone is looking at or the experience you're sharing with somebody based on the environment, uh, based on a song that's playing, based on anything. It's an easy way to open a door for me. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, it's funny. I th I think the more you put you, the more you put yourself in situations where you're uncomfortable, I think the more you're apt to kind of jump over that hurdle. Yeah. And I remember we done we had done this um when when I had a uh, a show on the air. There was this we we did a comedy tour, uh, like like these guys, but less successful, no. and a lot more affordable. Stop and uh, we it. we did so I toured with Roy Wood Jr., Owen Benjamin, and Ahmed Ahmed, and um we'd go around and every now and then you'd see kind of like a wallflower that was by himself. And I remember this kid in Connecticut, he was Korean, he came to the show by himself. And we ended up taking him out that night. We said, you're coming with us. That's great. We got him hammered. And then we went back the next year. He came again by himself. Uh, we went out with him that night. And he kept in touch with us. And we flew him out to California. And he was an extra on the show. He was on a show with Ken Jeong. Now he's on, on the set Amazing. in Warner Brothers. Because, because he, and, and he's taking pictures with Ken Jeong. We're all introducing to everybody. And then we're partying afterwards on the set, and this kid was having a great time. And then I'd I'd, t I'd, I'd got a text from him like, "Hey, I started seeing a girl." Ah. And he was like in his late twenties. Could you was... fly both of us out to California? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the show's canceled. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but that experience never would have happened if he didn't go out, get in his car, buy a ticket, and say, "I'm just going to sit here by myself." Yes. And we all picked up on it, and over the course of three to four years. You know, he'd come to shows, and I think that in some way kind of helped him get out of his shell. Yeah. And he was like, hey, I'm seeing somebody now. And I, there's been a handful of instances where I've kept in touch with people I've met after shows, and that's kind of been the situation. So to this young gentleman, I would say, yeah, just like Joe said, put yourself in those situations. And I think for the most part, guys pick up on that stuff. Yeah. You know, if you're ever at a bar and you're kind of by yourself— and you're sitting there, guy. Hey, how you doing, man? While you're waiting for the bartender, let me get you around. Whatever. So those yep. things kind of happen naturally. I think the uh, one one thing that I'd always I had done a lot of research in my earlier years because I was a little bit awkward, and I've read a lot of books about like gentlemen at the table and uh, you know things about etiquette and things about conversation and you know how to you know just like self helpy kind of books about coming out of your shell. And All whatnot. the Steve Harvey collection. Stuff. Yeah, like that. Yeah. So how to, I, how to think like a woman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Talk like a man. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> I did, uh, and rock a mustache. I I did a, I, one that stuck with me was the hardest the hardest sentence to start a conversation is the second one, and that always stuck with me because an opening sentence can yeah, be that's anything, right, yeah. but to keep a conversation going, yeah, is a little like is it a, a line and you say hello and then it's over, or now if you want to have a conversation, the second line you right. really have as as much importance as the first one. So don't study like openers. Like think about ways to be a conversationalist and think about ways to engage people, and that's where that's the difference is. Where'd you re read that? <clears throat> I forget at this point. It was great. A long time ago, yeah. It, it is so true, though, because it's so easy to acknowledge, you know, you're sitting in the elevator. Oh, thank God it took forever, right? Yeah. And then you're sitting there forever, and you're just, <laughs> yeah. yeah but but I think it, it's so much easier to, um, like, if I was in Rockefeller Center, I was taking pictures, and somebody's like, it's my first time here. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, all of a sudden, I, I'd have a, th oh, you got to yeah. check this out. You got to go there. Have you eaten here? I mean, it's a great like, icebreaker for me. Yeah. And that is the one, one of the good things about everybody having a phone in their pocket for me mm -hmm. is when people are taking selfies. Can I take one? Yeah, do you want me yeah. take, do you want me to take one for you in places where the background is important? Yeah. I think that's a really so organic icebreaker for people. Would you like me to take a picture of your family? Yeah. You know, like that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, cuz there's always the odd duck out. 100 somebody yeah. somebody's missing out on the picture, you know. Yeah. So. so if you're if you're lonely and you've never had a a, a real family family experience and you feel like you're <laughs> missing out on then haunt people yes. at tourist spots and wait for the dad to take the picture of the family. And, and, and like, then can I, be part, of your can I yeah. be part of your family? Yeah. And then maybe they'll fly out to California. There you go. <laughs> and then you legally change your last name to Byrne. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. Mm. This is a very like interesting, interesting one. Ones. Yeah, I like this one. Let me put on my interesting face. And I think, <laughs> I think, I think you'd be a good conduit to answer this. Okay, this is coming to us from Joey. Joey, appreciate this. Hey, cool moms, love the podcast. Genuinely makes my day. Well, that makes our day, Joey. Yes, um, Joey. My question is, how do I get over the fear of my own birthday? I know it sounds weird, but I don't like celebrating it, especially when other people ask me what I want to do or what I want. I enjoy going big for other people's birthdays, but not my own. Maybe it's the attention or making people do things they might not want to do just for my birthday. I don't know. Any advice? Thanks for your time. Yep. Stop telling people when your birthday is next. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I was like this younger. Next. <laughs> you want to move on? No. Okay. You were like that younger? Yeah, you didn't want the eyeballs, right? Yeah, I think I think a like lot a, of it's that, right? It's like you don't want the eyeballs on you. Kind of like what? a little insecurity yeah. of like, I don't want the attention. Yeah, because you, were, you also, you were an ugly duckling when you were younger, right? You didn't want people looking at that mess. <laughs> You admittedly, you say yourself, you look like a shit show. Like I'm not saying this. I'm saying you. You have gone on this podcast and talked about what a disgusting shit show you were as a younger I wasn't boy. A disgusting <laughs> shit show. I was like a cute. Mm, you've never used the word cute to describe yourself. You what, said, what age? What age bracket are we talking? Thirteen year old monster is what you. Would oh describe yeah, yeah. Yourself I, as. I was a thirteen year old. Monster. Right. That's yeah. what you were saying. So that's yeah, okay just to acknowledge it. Bulky Ugh. hair, zits, yeah. teeth. Like Ooh. you look like I was chewing rocks. Yeah, all that. Yeah, and those noises. That's how it. That's, That's how you talk to people. They say, good morning, Steve. Go, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, Cross but, the eyeballs, well, foam. A lot, of it's, a lot of it's insecurity, right? A lot of it's got to come yeah. from you don't, not even insecurity. I won't even say insecurity. I will say want personality. Attention. Right, personality trait. Yeah. It's a personality trait. You don't want to be the center of attention. Again, we talked about my father earlier. Sure. That wasn't his deal. It was my mother's. Yeah. She loved making people laugh, putting on a big to-do and having, you know, being the reason of the party. Yeah. My father would love making one person laugh with a, an aside under sure. his breath. So it's it's different, you know? Yeah, when I lived in So LA, there's nothing wrong here, I think is my no, point. I don't I'm think saying. there's anything wrong. When I lived in Los Angeles, there were so many comics and entertainers I knew that threw their own birthday parties. That's weird for And me. I always thought that was kind of weird. I was like, mm. why am I gonna meet you at a bar to celebrate you? Like, you owe me $40. <laughs> like, why am I, why would I do that? But then I get older and I think like, the milestones you want to have one like I, I'm yeah. I, I got a 50th a few years down the road and I, I every now and then I think about it I'm like what would I do I cannot wait to I, I wanna... cannot wait for your 50th you know what I was thinking? we're gonna go ham you know what I was thinking goddamn comedy jam that'd be unbelievable we do it in Pittsburgh we do a goddamn comedy jam phenomenal. in Pittsburgh. phenomenal and get the crew phenomenal. get the the best pals and get them all there and say okay we're going to blow this out that's amazing yeah that'd be fun that's amazing yeah I for my one of my favorite birthday parties that I've done, and it became a little bit of a tradition, mm -hmm. was I would hire, uh, I would do a casino night at my home. Oh, that's and awesome. And I would invite people, and they would come. It would be 14 to 16 people. Yeah. I don't think you ever came. Did you come? Last year you came. That's right. So I would go to the dollar store, and I make a price. Did you guys go to that nice place for dinner? <laughs> I didn't get that. I didn't know you liked that last year. It's cool. It's fine. Like last year? When, when did yeah. you? It's fine. We're going to go after this. <laughs> um, we so we would have uh, I go to the dollar store and yeah. I would buy I would buy 16 items and mm -hmm. I put them on a prize table and whoever has the most money at the end and then like I have a, two, then I have two or three right then like I have a, like two or three good ones I have like airpods I, and the one those I wouldn't buy with like shit I got like in a gift bag that yeah. I was gonna use like a nice camera or something that I had one of or whatever mm -hmm. so a bluetooth speaker you know something like that that was worth yeah. a little bit of shit right so I'd have a couple of those on the table and then I would have a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Like, that was it. And then the, whoever had the most money at the end of the three hours yeah. went first. And then the second person oh, picked the third oh, person. Oh, that's picked. fun. So it goes all the way down the line. It was always so much fun. And then last year, I actually had an extra picture that they used on the Misery Index. Mm -hmm. And I autographed it, and I put it in a frame. And I had it like, it was one of them. <laughs> and it was the last thing left. Yeah. And, uh, and no, it wasn't the last thing left. It had gotten picked. And Murr had picked it. Murr and Melissa had picked it. And Justin, our good friend Justin, sure. is a terrible gambler, came in dead last. But the twist was, I said, Justin, you could either take it. What, what was It was Silly Putty. It was a Silly Putty left. I said, you could either take the Silly Putty or you could take that Silly Putty and trade it for anything in the room. And Justin went to Murray and got the no picture. Way. And he, it's hanging in Justin's bedroom. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> that's great. So I love that casino party. I thought it was such a fun thing. And I did it a couple. I've done it for a couple of years. But it's, it, it's really, really fun. Yeah. But it's kind of like you're not really partying together. You know, because only a couple people were gambling, so it kind of loses that. But it's like a nice event for a couple hours. Sure. But then after, everybody hangs out. So it's it ends hanging, up, yeah, yeah by the fire pit and stuff. So it's a fun time. Yeah, I think to his point, I don't think there's anything wrong with I think it's more in your head 100%. than anything else because you think, oh, everybody's mm -hmm. coming to celebrate. It's like, no, it's an excuse to hang out. Yes. And I would think that Also, people who don't want to come to celebrate aren't coming. So the people that yeah. came want to come. They want to come, yeah. yeah. I think the only thing I've ever done on my birthdays is I've had a nice dinner with, you know, a handful of friends. That's usually what I've done. At, and, the, uh, at the diner? Uh, no. <laughs> but next time you get so the you invite? Put yeah. it right back yeah. at you. Okay? <laughs> put it right We're back do at it you. All life. All life. All life. Oh, this, is it. This. this is it. Um, this is it. No, I just. Uh, do you think dinners. we'll be friends for life? I don't know. <laughs> 
Do you think this is fleeting? Do you think you're going to get bored of me? Am I like a shiny new toy for no, you No, right I would now? never get bored of you. You don't no. get bored of me, right? No, no. No, I, I think especially, you know, we could talk off air, but... <laughs> I, think, uh, you, you, I have some uh, grievances. We're here. We're here. We're here. We're here. I'll just say it on the air. I'll just say it on the air. No, no, no. Talk later. You can cut it out. I'll say it on the air. When, uh, you know, like, the shit hits the fan, right? And then I've always known you to be just a, a great, solid guy, a really great hang, a fun friend to be with. And I think when I was on the tour with you guys, you know, we would end up, at the top of the bus having these deep conversations and stuff and that was kind of like like a, a moment for me where I was like wow what a great dude you know oh, so we'd keep in touch and whatever and then when everything happened I just found myself like thinking about you and I'd call you and I'd be like hey man I'm just checking in and I, I you know I, I knew it how you know it just must have been difficult so I was just kind of checking in to let you know you know that your people care for you and you're loved and all that stuff and I think that's kind of what uh maybe open the gap for us, you know, to end up here. Yeah. Um, never intending, obviously, to, it was just like, literally just like, oh my God, I, I just hope you're okay. That's it, you know? Uh -huh. And as as the conversations progressed and, and everything went forward, you know, to find ourselves working on this together, it's been, this has been an immense joy. I really, really enjoyed oh, doing this, man. Too, it's been a total blast, so. This was almost named One Depressed Mom and Steve. <laughs> so, thank goodness you showed up. But to answer your question, yes, I, I do believe there's, there's like literally over the course of my lifetime, you know, uh, there's people I check in with routinely to just say, hey, you know, I'm just seeing how you're doing. And that's my way of communicating to these people. Like over the course of my life, all the by roads and highways and everything else and intersections, people, there's just certain people that have been caught in the dragnet that you're just like, I'd like to foster this relationship mm -hmm. and foster that relationship. And I might not see this individual every you know year or so, but at least we're still keeping in touch. And yeah. when we do catch up, it's like no, no time has ever passed. Oh, that's nice, Steve. Yeah. You're okay. Thanks. <laughs> We should grab Dennis. How, how crazy would it be if I said all that and I'm like, now your turn. Now your turn. Go. <laughs> Go. No. I mean, I, I, there, are, there, are, there are shining moments that are Steve Byrne. You are a light, my friend. And uh, I, I really appreciate our friendship. It's fun to actually get to know people when you're older in life, too, and you have experience to speak of. Yeah, yeah. Is it because friendships in, normally in the beginning are kind of – friendships born later in life are born out of people that you want to be friends with versus, like, necessity. Like, people you go to school sure. with or whatever. You're just around people and mm -hmm. friendships form. We weren't necessarily around each other, no. literally not even living in the same state. So it's been really cool to, to, to foster uh, uh, the Joe and Steve journey. And I'm excited to see where it takes us, Mommy. Me, too. <laughs> Me too. It's funny. It's probably was... a brunch. It's probably a brunch. <laughs> At your thing. And then dessert at Brooklyn Diner. There you go. Perfect. Yeah, we'll get some cheesecake. There you go. Okay, good. <laughs> Glad we got through that. That's nice. Together. That was nice. Um, okay, this one. Ooh, this one's we're going to get heavy? This one's a Hold on, let me stretch. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Okay. From Ashley. Mm -hmm. Hey, two cool moms. So my fiance and I are gay. And her parents don't accept her. And her mom tries to manipulate her into breaking up with me. It's hard right now because we're both in college still, and she's currently living at home. How do I get her to recognize how toxic her mother is to her mental health and to our relationship? Thanks, guys. I love listening to you, too. This is loaded. Oh. Well, Ashley's got <clears throat> Ashley's to first and foremost appreciate the trapped situation her lover is in. Right. Yeah, because That's it sounds it. like the mom's not necessarily accepting of the accepting of the of not the only identity and yeah, lifestyle. It has nothing to do with Ashley. It has to do with the lifestyle, right? Yeah, I don't even know if, if you call it lifestyle. I, I just is that what you call it, or it's lifestyle and identity, or I identity lifestyle. Or I, uh, well, just, just who the, you are. Just who she is. Yeah, she's yeah, just, just not accepting her for who yeah. she, who she or how she's choosing to express love in life. So yeah, uh, that's that's not has nothing to do with Ashley. I think what that has to do with is see the problem that Ashley's in here. The first thing that came to my mind was the friend's in for a rough ride. And what Ashley needs to do is be supportive to the woman she loves yeah. now, mm -hmm. or the person she loves now, because it's out of both of their controls. Because if she's in school and has to live home, what, what's her option? She doesn't really have options. She has to go through this reality. Yeah. So what she needs is a support system of, to know that she can be loved and feel safe when she's out of the home or yeah. things like that, right? So talking bad about somebody's mom and trying to make them feel that they're toxic. Like you're with this person. So you have to realize that they probably 
you, you appreciate them and their sensibilities. So yeah. I don't think she needs you to tell her. I think, I think she'd probably pick up on that. Yeah. Look, that's her mom. That's never going to change. Right. Um, but what I think Ashley should, or at least as a friend, I would recommend to somebody in this situation, I'd say, look, you're in college now. So power through this, yep. enjoy the college experience. And I assume if the relationship they're, they're engaged. So hopefully this continues to go the distance. As you grow older, the relationship will continue to grow and mature. So, you know, I, I'd be more concerned about the time I spend with my partner, yeah, as opposed to worrying about the peripheral that you you can't control it. Yeah. And I think over time, if if the true love is fostered and you do end up getting married, knock on wood, that hopefully at some point down the line, the mother will come to recognize, oh, this is this is this is the real deal. Yeah. This is not some phase or anything else yes. or whatever. I, I mean, she that's has to the accept way. the mother has to accept on her terms. And, that, and that, a lot of that happens when the people realize their own mortality, you know, yeah. when the mom realizes, okay, I have the choice here that like, I'm going to lose my daughter for the rest of my life or accept her lifestyle. Hopefully most people make the right choice of accepting and letting people make their own choices. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what all parents try to, you try, you know, it might become from a place of protection, might become from a place of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know where the mother's head is at. Um, but that is not on Ashley. That is not on her partner. Yeah. You know, um, so I really just think do your best to be a support system for it. You don't want to be another stress. She already has a stress about living at home with someone who doesn't accept her or her partner. And you don't want her to leave when she leaves that to come to a place where she's hearing about that. Yeah, right? I also think it's like don't be so concerned about. Yes. Again, the peripheral of the relationship, it just as long as the core, you two, are in sync and respectful and loving of each other, like my wife and I, we're married, and I we really don't think about my folks that much. I mean, my folks accept us, they appreciate us. Did they like it's her not, when you were dating? Loved her. Yeah. Yeah, but even if they didn't, if they hated her, I'd, I'd still be like, okay, well, it's not like they're living with us. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like... You know, come holidays, yeah, that could be an issue, I right, guess. Right, but now the flip of that with Ashley is Ashley's partner. She's living with them. Right. That's why I, I'm thinking if you're in the relationship for the long haul, yeah. right, just to understand you're in college. You got, what, another two, yeah. three years? Because it, it doesn't sound like she's a freshman, freshman. or sophomore. Yeah, yeah. So I think, okay, well, get through college, enjoy the experience, and then you'll probably move in together, find a new city to to you know to foster the relationship in, and build it out from there. But... But I wouldn't be too concerned about the peripheral yeah. right now. It's like, why? Focus on the two of you, I think is the message we're sending here. Yeah, yeah, Focus yeah. on you two. I try to be there for her. And, you know, she doesn't, she, if you don't think she, if you don't think she realizes her mother's toxic, that's a different issue. <laughs> but I, I, from the way you phrased it, I feel like she knows that. So I yeah. would just, I would just be, I would just be as supportive as you can for your partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's only so much you can do. 100%. You can't. You can't. It's not like you're going to change the mom's mind or or change the dynamic between right. your partner and the mom. Just be there to be supportive of your partner. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. That's tough. I feel for. Her. That's a tough one. Yeah. I mean, do you ever think about like telling the mom, "Go fuck yourself"? <laughs> like, does, does that come up at all? Because like, there's the other thing too, right? Yeah. I'm just thinking about this because like. Who are you to, to, to dominate, at, at, especially at that level? You know, I get you're under my roof and all that kind of thing, whatever. But, like, to, to torture somebody that you care about, do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about... I don't know what I would do. Like, honestly, if somebody was... I was just playing it out in my mind. That's why I was staring off into the sunset. I was, yeah. I was thinking, is there, is there part of me that... Like, part of me actually wants to tell the mother, you, you know, go, you know... You know what, I, I Go I see think a bird or whatever the... Parent whatever the what was wants this? their kid to, to be appreciated and cared for yes. and loved, right? For sure. And I don't think there's any harm, and I've mentioned this a few times, of like, you know, behind closed doors, conversations are going to happen, right? And the mom's toxic. But if, like, if the mom was open to it, it's like, why not just sit down and I say, can we have a talk? And, and, and I'd go there, Ashley, and say, this is why I love your daughter. These are the exact reasons why I love your daughter. I love what and you're saying. I love what you're doing. But for me, why does she have to do that? If she's looking to, to solve, if got she's it. looking to solve, if she's it. looking to solve, that's that could be a way to go. If she got a problem, you will solve it, and that's how she could do it. You go talk to the mom and revolve it about all the reasons why she loves her daughter. I see that, but I'm part of me is like being like, 
why why does the mom get to be like prove to me why you're the one for my daughter yeah, yeah. Kind of me it's kind of like well, yeah, yeah by the way i'm a, i'm with you on that yeah. i'm totally with you on that i'm it's a little torn like, here honestly i don't i could see it going both both ways here but it all comes back to me first you got to be there for your partner and that's what the the main thing is yeah What's, the nucleus of of the of the two is is paramount got it as long as you two are happy ultimately that's all that really matters at the end of the day all right next question it was good good luck to you ashley uh this we is going we got time for one more colin and i think this is more of a compliment than anything okay a few episodes back joe had said something along the lines of love is life is like an airport most people are passing through some uh some people are on layover and are only meant to stick around for a little while then there's a few that have reached their destination that are going to stick around, uh, that are going to stick around. That has really resonated with me. Uh, I'm 28, and I've been stuck in nostalgia for some time thinking about the past and memories I have with different people. Mm. The airport metaphor has helped me with closure and peace. I just want to thank both of you cool moms for all your wisdom. It's the perfect balance of comedic and genuinely helpful. Odd, odd, oddly worded sentence, but it's the perfect balance of comedy and it's genuinely helpful. Oh. There, I, I just auto-corrected it. That was nice. That was great. That was very nice of you, Colin. Colin did the best. And yeah. thank you, Grammarly, for jumping in. Uh, <laughs> I will say this. You know what? After that episode, the one he's talking about, I remember that because I remember speaking about that. I went through my phone, mm -hmm. and I texted certain people who I hadn't texted in a while. Oh, really? Thinking about that to see if anybody... Uh, you know, just to, just to check in with people that I still and how care many unsubscribes did you get? Back? I got seven, which yeah. is not bad because I sent I sent <laughs> ratio, I sent yeah. eight. Yeah. So uh, uh, no, I, I it was it was interesting to to practice what I preached in that moment because I remember sure. that and I remember when I got home I was sitting in my apartment mm -hmm. and it was a not okay night and I was just sitting there and I was like let me just reach out to people and see and I had some very nice conversations and actually one phone call oh, that night nice. which was yeah. really cool so. Um, yeah, I appreciate that you appreciate that, and it helped me too. So that's why. That's also why I love being a cool mommy. <laughs> that's it. The burden of responsibility. It is, man. But also, it, it is applicable to us at, at home when we're looking at ourselves in the mirror. There have been conversations and questions we've answered where it's impacted me to do something and spurred me, like you said. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think it's, it was a great metaphor too, by the way. Thank you. It was really cool, yeah. I appreciate it as much as, uh, as Colin did. Thank you, Captain. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, my co-pilot, through this craziness. Steve you Byrne, it. you are the best. Love you, Mommy. These two cool mommies love you, so show us some love. Please rate us, review us, follow us on all social media, and subscribe to our YouTube.